Okay. So I did not get your exams done. If it's if it's killing you next week, remember you emailed me for your exam score. But if you if it's killing you, I can send it to you if you're able to get email. And if you're all the people that aren't here, probably in disclosed areas. Um. <clears throat> Okay. Any questions about? Let's see. We did side. Re, we said side chain reactions on Wednesday. So unfortunately, the side chain reactions. Oh, I know what we were going to start with. We were going to start with the epoxide issue. So, for that reaction, I've got an, let's see, I've got an A and a B. So, where, where do we think that the CL is going to end up in that reaction? On A or on B? B. Or fifty fifty. So I hear a B, I hear a fifty fifty. <clears throat> Since there's so few people here, and yes, I'm shaming you while listening to this right now in podcast form. I would say maybe A too. Well, those are the three choices. So we got A, we got B, and we got fifty-fifty. <laughs> so let's, I mean, let's let's argue for each one. So argument for fifty-fifty. So A and B are both what? Secondary? So we could make the argument that it's 50-50 based on the fact that A and B are, are both secondary. We could argue for B based on... Uh, a is a benzoic carbon. So when the H attaches to the O, the O will go to A. The O will go to A. So then C will have that. C will have Okay, let's do the mechanism. I was with you until the end. So we're going to protonate the oxygen, and this is still going to be, this is still going to add the Cl and the OH will end up in the end being trans. So we, so we could, if we wanted to, swing the OH this way or swing the OH that way if we wanted to show the carbocation, but that's not how it's going to go. It's still going to stay intact as the triangle. So what we've been saying is which one of those two carbons, A or B, is going to have the greatest delta positive charge? It's going to be A because it's a benzylic carbocation. So where's the chloride going to add? A. The chloride's going to add to A, and then the OH is going to swing over to B. So if that was the argument, then what would happen is the Cl minus, the Cl minus would come in and add to the carbon because this one's going to be benzylic, and it's going to have the most delta positive charge. And if you wanted to, you could swing the OH to the right, write the carbocation, swing the OH to the left, write the carbocation, and, and they would both be secondary, but one's going to be secondary benzylic versus secondary non-benzylic. So just to keep the triangle intact so that the chlorine and the OH have to be trans, 
we're going to say that the, the benzylic position has the most delta positive charge. So that would be an argument for that would be an argument for um, for adding the chloride to A. And then if you were to make an argument for B, what would the argument be? <coughs> Nobody wants to make an argument for B, for adding the chloride to B? Um, the steric hindrance. The steric hindrance of the ring. That would be the argument for B. But because this is a benzylic carbon, because this is benzylic carbon, the Cl minus will add to the benzylic position. So this would be the major product under acidic conditions. If I change it, if I change and say, okay, let's do this reaction with a Cl minus, and then we'll add H plus, now what, now what comes into play? the steric hindrance of the benzene ring. So now it's benzene ring versus methyl group. Benzene ring is more sterically hindered. That means the chloride is going to come in and attack the carbon that is least hindered. So that we end up with an O minus. And then when I add the H plus to it, I'm going to end up with the Chloride now adding to B. So the steric hindrance argument is best argued with Cl minus as opposed to HCl. So my whole point here is number one, to review about epoxides, and number two, remind you that that benzylic carbocation is a special position unless it's up against a tertiary, apparently. And if your if your question is, well, how about the epoxide? How about opening up the epoxide with the benzene ring versus the tertiary? We haven't done that because I can't buy that compound. But if I have the double bond that I already have, I can epoxidize it with an epoxidizing reagent. So I, we could do that. And in order to get it, eventually, once we figure out what we got to do, somebody's going to say, "Did you do that?" So we'll probably end up doing that to from my story from last time. So the benzene ring on the side chain, what can we do with it? We can do what we did in lab yesterday. We can cleave, um, bless you, we can cleave and leave a benzoic acid, turn the benzylic carbon into a carboxylic acid with camino 4. If we free radically halogenate, we're going to halogenate at the benzylic position. And any of the reactions we do with double bonds, putting the double bond in conjugation with the benzene ring is going to be the most stable. And then if we add something, again, avoiding that situation, most likely the benzylic carbocation is going to form. So in side chain reactions, that's kind of what we're, what we're up against. Okay. So that's, that's all the side chain reactions, which could be really messy because it basically can bring into everything that we did we've done this year because I neglected triple bonds but if I brominated if I free radically brominated then formed the double bond then two BRs then two NH2 minuses I got a triple bond so if I have a triple bond attached to the benzene ring now I have chapter you know 13 so there's a lot of side chain reactions we can do So that's, that's sort of the, that's all the side chain reactions, and they come before actually doing something to the ring, starting to add groups inside the ring. Because the first question is, if the benzene ring is really stable, how can I add something inside of it? So first, the first reaction inside the ring is, is going to be a unique reaction, 
It's called birch reduction. And this is going to destroy the aromaticity of the ring. Can I do that? I can, but it's going to take super harsh conditions. So, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if this is in the book. I know it's in my PowerPoint notes, but I'll just, I'm going to show it to you. I can take this benzene ring and I can convert it to a non-conjugated um, cyclohexene, cyclohexadiene system. So in order to destroy the aromaticity of the ring, I'm going to have to use super harsh conditions. My, my really harsh conditions are going to be sodium metal in liquid ammonia. So I could ask, I could say sodium metal in liquid ammonia, where have we seen that before? Page turning would occur. It would be when we took the triple bond where we've seen sodium and liquid ammonia before was if I took a triple bond and I wanted to make the tra trans double bond, that reaction was sodium with liquid ammonia. And the mechanism of that reaction involved the sodium. Sodium has one un, has one valence electron, so when you put it into liquid ammonia, it gives up the electron. So the electron is just kind of swimming around in the ammonia, and then the electron will add into the benzene ring. And the reason ultimately that the double bonds form there is because the key intermediate for this reaction is this radical anion where we've got two electrons in this orbital for the negative charge and then we have the radical part down here in this, um, in this other one. Those are two big clouds of negative charge. They've got to get 180 degrees away from each other in the ring. So that causes those um, two orbitals then to be para to each other. It's not para now because it's not a benzene ring, but 1,4. So that was the reason why the two hydrogens up here ended up adding trans is because you got two big lobes and they've got to be trans, not cis. And the mechanism for this is, if nothing else, is in the handouts that were in um, Wednesday's folder, and I'll move them to today. But that's you, when you take this double, when you take the benzene ring and you treat it with basically a naked electron, which is what happens when the sodium goes into liquid ammonia, it gives up the electron. That is the most reducing conditions you can get, right? Because gain electron is reduction. Gaining a pure electron from the solvent <coughs> is as reducing as you can get. And that reaction's been around for a long time, pre-batteries. You could say, well, can't you take a battery and throw an electron in from the circuit? You could, but this predates that. So what we're doing is we're just adding an electron to it, and then eventually that will destroy the benzene ring. So ultimately what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with two Adding two, adding two hydrogens, and you will end up with a 1,4 cyclohexadiene. You might, and you might say, well, um, why would you, why would you ever want to destroy a benzene ring? Well, there's, there's times when you might want to take the benzene ring and convert it into a cyclohexane that you could do something with. So there's not, this, the number of reactions are limited for the benzene. If I make it just a non-conjugated alkene, now I could add Br2s to it, and I could do all those reactions. And there's, um, 
there are systems that can undergo tautomerism where something similar happens. So if you have two OHs here, you can end up with an equilibrium. Well, actually, it's, it's a reaction. You could end up with two OHs on a benzene ring that then could become um, ketones in a non-benzene ring. That kind of reaction also involves electron movements. That's sort of the hydroquinone type molecules that use. When we did photography on paper <coughs> with film, right? Eventually, no one's going to remember those days. But when you did photography with films and you were developing the um, negatives and also the paper, that reaction, and that's an oxidation reduction reaction because basically what I'm doing is losing two electrons to get to the right. So it's, it's a very similar looking reaction to this. So birch reduction is destroying the aromaticity. It's a unique reaction, but it's liquid um, sodium, liquid ammonia. Now, for the birch reduction, the question is, well, what if, there was an R, what would, what if there's a group on the ring? What would happen then? And it's a very simple answer. You're going to get the most stable set of double bonds that aren't conjugated. So what do I mean? If I take my benzene ring and I put a CH3 group on it and I say, let's do, let's do a birch reduction on that, the two possibilities are that when I, f I can form my double bonds where the methyl group would be attached not to the double bond, or I can form my double bonds where the methyl group is attached to the double bonds. Again, I'm not forming a conjugated system. I'm forming the 1,4 non-conjugated system here. So this reaction is straightforward. You get the more stable product. And so this one is the major product. That one is a minor product if it forms. So if we do Birch reactions with alkyl groups on the ring, you will get the most stable product. The most stable product being the one where the alkyl group is attached to the double bond. So that, you just have to remember, I will always get the more stable product for that. Okay. So it's a unique reaction, but it, it can be used to destroy aromaticity and then convert your molecule into something else. But it is harsh. I mean, there's nothing harsher than throwing a pure electron at something. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Okay, so now what we... Sorry, is that a mechanism that we'll have to know? No. It's like the, it was like the triple bond being reduced down to the trans one. I've shown the, me I've shown the mechanism in the, in the PowerPoints, and you end up with the anion and the radical, and they have to be away from <coughs> each other. The reason I showed you that intermediate was because if you got stuck, you could go... Okay, this is the one with the two lobes of electron density. They got to be away from each other, so that means the double bonds have to be non conjugated because that's where the two hydrogens go. So, no, it's not a mechanism that I would give you. A mechanism that I would give you is now to add stuff inside the benzene ring. So, we know that for the benzene ring, it's super stable because it's aromatic. And it's not going to react with the normal reagents that we react it with. So if you take benzene and KMnO4, KMnO4 should cleave the double bond or add two H's? No. Br2? No. We need a catalyst that we'll learn about today. So KMnO4, no. Br2, HCl, sulfuric acid. All these things with benzene ring are no reaction because it's aromatic and it's really stable. Can I add, though, something inside of the benzene ring? And the answer to that is yes. 
So I'm going to start with this generic E+. Plus, and then all of our reagents are going to be used to generate different E+. Pluses. So if I make an E+, plus that can add to the ring, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a pair of electrons from the double bond, and I'm going to use it to bond to E+. Plus, just like I would any other alkene. So this has to be a really strong E+. Plus. There's no Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, so let's add the E to here. That will leave a positive charge there. So I'm just going to add the electrophile to the carbon with the hydrogen. All right, so now what did I just make? An allylic carbocation. And that allylic carbocation has how many resonance structures? It's got two more. So if I take this pair of electrons, move it here, I can now form that resonance structure with the plus charge now, um, what would have been para if this was a benzene ring away from where I added the electrophile. And I have one more double bond that I could move this way. So now I can form the plus charge there. So we we did this with the we sort of did this with the benzylic carbocation, right? We put the plus charge inside the ring. And we definitely did this with allylic systems. It's just now I have an allylic system that has two double bonds. Right? So the way organic chemistry books are structured is we have to do allylic carbocations before we can do benzylic carbocations before we can write these. Because all we're doing is just sequentially building up. Right? If you're like, this is all random and there's no logic to it, there's logic. The people who defy the logic when they write a new book, it never sells and nobody ever uses it. So and it's like every time everybody wants to get out of functional group, one at a time. That book is like revolutionary and it dies. Nobody ever uses it because it makes sense to go through step by step. So this is what we're doing, which is good if you have this under control from the last exam. Not so good if you don't. Okay, Because this is a mechanism that I could ask you to do. Um, so once I make these resonance structures, what did we do with the allylic carbocation? Well, we had a nucleophile that came in and we added it to each one of the carbocations and then we had a kinetic and we had a thermodynamic product. But the problem here is that if I add like a chloride or if I add a nucleophile to each one of those plus charges, what have I done to the ring? I've destroyed the aromaticity of the ring. So the molecule, if possible, would like to go back to being aromatic. So it's not going to accept the nucleophile adding to those positive charges. Instead, what it's going to do is it's going to go, you know what, hydrogen, I'm going to lose that hydrogen, bring that pair of electrons back. So I lose my H+, plus, and now I have, I've reformed my double bond, but what have I done? I've substituted my electrophile for my hydrogen. So the three resonance structures that I drew on top, if we added a nucleophile to those, we would have basically electrophilic addition to the benzene ring. Well, there is no such thing. Because instead what we have is electrophilic substitution. So these reactions are called electrophilic aromatic substitution. And that's why all the videos are labeled EAS, because it's electrophilic aromatic substitution. Is there a nucleophilic substitution? Yes, we'll get to that. 
But this is the easier of the two electrophilic, electrophilic substitution. Okay, so we lose the H plus. So what I'm doing is I'm substituting an electrophile for the H plus through this mechanism. And we could write, I guess if we want to be complete on this, we could have a resonance hybrid for those three resonance structures and they would have delta pluses again on every carbon that has a positive charge and then the delta the partial bonds go from one delta plus all the way to the other so before when i said you know if you you don't have to average things out you can just okay everywhere there's a plus charge let's write delta plus and then write the dot, dotted lines between the two tilt the pluses. That's what we would do. Okay. So this is a generic mechanism for electrophilic aromatic substitution. All I have to do is use a specific E plus. Okay. And it will substitute a hydrogen. Now what we're going to start with is benzene. We're going to start with benzene because it doesn't matter what hydrogen I add to the room, what hydrogen I substitute for. So benzene is going to be easy. And then we build it up to let's put a group on the ring. Well, if I put a group on the ring and I now want to add my electrophile, where does my electrophile go? Does it go to the ortho position, the meta position, or the para position? Well, it's going to depend on what groups on the ring. Well, what kinds of groups can be on the ring? Electron donating and electron withdrawing. The electron donating groups direct the electrophile to one position, or actually two positions, and if it's electron withdrawing, it goes to the opposite position. Then we gotta go why. We won't go too much into the pushing and pulling because we did that, but we'll, re we'll refresh. So it all sequentially goes together. So is everybody kind of with me here? So it doesn't matter what my E plus is, it's going to substitute for a hydrogen. So what kinds of E pluses can I make? Well, this is where the reagents come into play. So let's say you want to make a Br+. plus. Now the problem is Br2, when we reacted Br2 with the double bond, the double bond sort of reacted, when the, when the bromine approached the double bond, the bromine became slightly positive, not good enough here. I need to make a true Br+. plus. So the way we do that is we use either iron, um, and I'm, let's make this generic, so we're going to use iron trichloride or aluminum, or sorry, aluminum trihalide. So X could be bromine or chlorine here, just to make it general. So we could use a bromine or a chlorine. And then what I'm going to do is then I'm going to use the halogen. So I'm going to mix the halogen, Br2, Cl2, with FeCl3, aluminum trichloride, or Br2, FeBr3, Fe, or AlBr3. So what happens here is that the iron, and we'll make this, let's make this specific for iron, brom, iron tribromide. What happens is, is the bromine, first of all, reacts with the iron tribromide, and the Br- minus gets given to the Fe. So what I end up doing is I end up forming a true Br plus and then FeBr, FeBr4 minus. So a Br, this breaks apart completely. We get a Br plus and we get an uh, FeBr minus. And aluminum does the same thing. And the same thing would be true if we erased the bromines to make chlorides. So the idea here is that if I use iron or aluminum, and without that, the reaction's gonna be no reaction. But if I mix my halogen with, one, with iron or aluminum, then I'm gonna make a true Br plus, and that Br plus is gonna be strong enough to add into the ring, 
so that what I'm going to end up making is I'm going to make end up making something like bromobenzene or chlorobenzene. But I need to generate the Br plus or the Cl plus by using aluminum and iron or iron. There's plus and minuses to each. I think aluminum would be the more traditional reagent. I personally like the iron tribromide, iron tribromide or chloride, because like with iron uh, trichloride, it's purple. And it has a problem of getting wet, then it turns yellow. So when, we used, when we, we've done this reaction in the past, I have to make sure I mine all the purple stuff out of the bottle. Because the bottle's layered with about two inches of yellow stuff. So I have to go in and chip that all away to get to the purple stuff below. And if it's not purple, then the reaction won't go. Aluminum trichloride, I don't know whether it's good or not. If it smokes, it's good because it's reacting with the moisture in the air. So that's the first easy one to make. Just use that. And we're going to use Fe and aluminum in other reactions too because Fe and aluminum have that ability to pull that halogen away. So we're going to extend that and say, what if you want to make a carbocation? That's going to be a new way to make a carbocation. So that's one. Um, another reagent that we can use, so that's the first E plus would be a halogen. We can also take nitric acid and we can take sulfuric acid and mix those together. And when you do that, what you end up doing is the sulfuric acid protonates the nitric acid that then loses water so that what happens is you lose water and you make an NO2 plus. So you make a nitro group. And that nitro group then will add to the double bond, or will add to the benzene ring. So if I want to make nitrobenzene, I can do that reaction. So we can mix nitric and sulfuric together and nitrate the ring. Now, as I'm adding these groups to the ring, one of the things to maybe think about is what kind of group was a halogen? Donator and withdrawing? It's withdrawing. What's nitro? It's also withdrawing. It's not going to be good enough to just know if they're withdrawing or not. This is more withdrawing than that. So we're going to have to learn that chart from top to bottom that I kind of previewed. But if you want to add a nitro group to the ring, that's what you do. <coughs> and we'll come back to that because one of the things that early on people wanted to add nitro groups to was toluene with the CH3 and you can end up adding a grand total of three nitro groups to the toluene to make tri-nitro toluene it, it, it is it's that TNT but Dynamite slightly different than TNT. Or no, TNT is dynamite, right? I'm just thinking so. <laughs> not, this, not the little sticks that you light on fire and blow little things up with. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. Did not think we would be quoting ACDC, <laughs> I believe. And, but yes, that's, that's exactly what it is. Oh, sorry. It, it, that is dynamite. Um, Nitroglycerin is a different explosive. So, t so trinitrotoluene is what's in dynamite, the nitroglycerin. I think there you can also make it that way too. One of these is the reason Alfred Nobel made all of his money, blew up a few family members along the way. Um, we'll come back to this because 
Putting the first group on the ring is easy. Putting the second group requires a little bit of heat. Putting the third group on the ring requires a little bit more heat, but you've got to balance between heat and explosion. So you, when you're making that stuff, there can be accidents. And ultimately, that's why Nobel decided to, when he died, give all his money to the charity and the prizes and all of that stuff. Allegedly, he's the sixth cousin of so many Grand, so many people from my grandfather. But if you have any kind of Swedish heritage, you would have, you would probably be related to him because it's such a small country. But that's that's what that's what it is. So we'll talk about that because if I add the nitro group to a meth, where where does it go relative to the methyl? Well, you can actually see it goes ortho and para, and we'll have to talk about why. So. That's where nitro comes into play. The other, another one we can add is we can add a, we can take our benzene and react H2SO4 with SO3. This is called fuming sulfuric acid because we've added sulfur trioxide to the sulfuric acid. It's called fuming because when you take the, the cap off of it, smoke comes out because the SO3 is reacting with the moisture in the air to make more sulfuric acid. You've, in general chemistry, you may have seen the, right, you've seen the smokes come together like ammonia and HCl to make the ammonium chloride, if you've done that. So when you react this, what simply happens is the sulfuric acid protonates the SO3 and makes an SO, HSO3+. Plus. So all these reagents are doing nothing more than generating an E+. Plus. And then that E plus is going to add into the ring. So what we end up doing is we end up adding SO3H to the ring, or substituting. Our SO3H group looks like this. That is called a sulfonic acid. And we've seen that before because I take my sulfonic acid, and we will do this in the future. I put a methyl group here. I make my sulfonic acid, but then what do I do? I convert this OH into a... Cl, and I have so this forms the tosyl chloride. So that's how a tosyl chloride is made. I'm obligated to ask the next question. How do we convert the OH to the CL? PCL3, SOCL2. Remember, that's what those, that's what those jo the jobs of those reagents are. This is a perfect place for them. So if we make the sulfonic acid, we can convert it to the chloride by SOCL2 or um, PCL3. HCl does not work with that, only those two reagents. So I can make the causal chloride. And sulfonic, the sulfonic acids themselves are sometimes used for ion exchange resins. So if you have a water softener that softens the water, which basically means that when you mix it with soap, it doesn't form the hard soap scum which is characteristic of hard water, um, the ion exchange beads are a lot of times sulfonic acids that grab the um, ions, the calcium and the magnesium ions in the water to keep them soft. So that's a third method, a third group we can add. And we're going to have to add a whole bunch of groups. Like, how do you add a C triple bond N? We'll get there. 
How do you add a methyl group or an ethyl group? Well, that we can get to. So all we need to do is generate a plus. So if I want to add an alkyl group to the ring, I just need to make a carbocation. Well, there are multiple ways that I can make carbocations. Now let's do this. Let's say I take an alcohol. How do I convert the alcohol into a carboxylic acid? How about we add H plus to it? If I add H plus to the alcohol, what will happen? I'll form an oxonium ion. If it's a secondary or tertiary, I will make a carbocation. What can that carbocation do? Add to the benzene ring. So if I react the benzene ring with isopropyl alcohol and water, I can make isopropyl benzene. How else can I make double how else can I make carbocations? Um, let's say that I did this. I added H plus to a double bond. If I add H plus to a double bond, what happens? I add the H plus Markovnikov. And what does that do? That carbocation then reacts to the benzene ring. And I end up making, in this case, I would end up making tertiary butyl benzene. So any of our methods that we use, that we've used in the past to make carbocations, any of those methods will add that carbocation to the benzene ring, which is a complication. Because if I'm going to do a reaction with a if I'm going to do a reaction where I make a carbocation, I cannot use an aromatic <coughs> solvent. So I couldn't do this reaction in benzene or toluene because that carbocation would end up adding into the benzene ring. So that's that's a, that's something I have to avoid. But if you want to make a carbocation and add it to the benzene ring, that's great. You can do that all day long. It's not traditionally how it's been done, but it works because it's what we've learned before. But we just learned a new way to make carbocations, or I just said a new way to carbocat to make carbocations that hasn't that's got to get stuck in here. And I'm pointing to my head. For those of you again shamefully not coming to class and listening. And that is, take my chloride and add to it aluminum trichloride. So if I take an alkyl halide and I react it with aluminum trichloride, this would also work with iron trichloride. So I could use either one of those. What's going to happen is that aluminum and the and the iron is going to pull the chlorine Cl minus off, and I'm going to end up making the carbocation plus AlCl4 minus or FeCl4 minus, whichever one, and then that carbocation will react with the benzene ring so that I can still make my isopropyl benzene that way. So using iron and aluminum trichloride is a new way of making it. That's been the traditional way, and that's what's called the Friedel-Crafts reaction.
And so that's a traditional way. And the traditional Friedel Crafts was using iron, or was using iron, or sorry, no, it's using aluminum. Um, but you can also do it with iron. So only thing about that is it's not the cheese. Right, it's not Kraft's cheese. That's like a ketone with a Y. There are certain things that are like fingernails on a chalk, on a, on a brown board or whatever these things are with me. Ketones with Ys and Friedel Crafts with a K. Okay. And the last one that we'll introduce here, and then um, the Monday after break, all of your exams, and then we will um, we'll talk about what happens when there's a group on the ring, where the electrophile will go, because again, if there's a group on there, it either goes ortho, meta, or para, and if it was just random, we would say it's random and move on, and that would save us about a week, but it's not random. The other thing to do is another Friedel Crafts reaction. This is called Friedel Crafts alkylation. And hopefully at this point you're kind of saying, oh yeah, there's a sort of a pattern with these terms. Alkylation means you're adding an alkyl group. So if you want to add a carbonyl group to the ring, what we do there is we simply say, okay, I'm going to use my same aluminum trichloride catalyst. Only now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to attach the chlorine to the carbonyl group so that the chlorine will go with the aluminum trichloride. We will make a C double bond O with the plus charge on the carbon and then we would make aluminum tetrachloride anion. And you might look at this and go, that doesn't look very stable. Except, I know at least in my class when we talked about mass spectrometry, we talked about the stability of that carbocation. That is called a acylenium ion because I can bring this pair of electrons down and I can form a resonance structure where the positive charge gets moved to the oxygen. But the critical part is I'm making another carbocation, I'm making an E+, plus, and once I make that E+, plus, it would now add into the benzene ring. So this is a perfect way to make <coughs> what I introduced on Wednesday, which was the idea of what's called a phenyl ketone. So Friedel Crafts alkylation is adding just any alkyl group. Friedel Crafts acylation is when you add a carbonyl group, add an acyl group to the ring. So these are the big easiest groups to add so far. But every single one of these mechanisms would be what I did before. You would erase the E plus and you would put in your new plus and then do the reaction. What's going to become a little bit trickier is what do I do if there's already a group on the ring? And that's going to require us to remember what's donating, what's withdrawing, know the chart, from top to bottom, most to least. Actually, it's from most to most, most electron donating to most electron withdrawing, and to be able to do that. Okay. okay, so I will be lecturing. No quiz when we get back. That would be, I should have said there would have been a quiz and then shut the tape off so the people thought they were going to be there. Um, if you have any questions, why are you asking questions over spring break? But if you did, I'll be an I'll be here answering questions. Enjoy your break. Be safe. Don't do stupid things. <laughs>